and in a few minutes we'll have it all set up all the way this just goes to show you this getting on live is more than a notion it ain't as simple as we think so i will no longer be making fun of any celebrity <laughs> trying to get this thing together you look so beautiful and glowing i, when I texted you earlier and i asked was you shining i didn't know like shining shining shining, shining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so let's just give a little bit of background first and foremost hello everybody i am lakeisha gray sewell the founder ceo of girls like me project um and I have with me a guest. This is actually our very first time doing this uh, Real Chicago, Real Founders of Chicago Talks. And I got to give a shout out to my girls, Jamila Makani Trumiel and uh, Apricia Faulkner, who in one of our sister get togethers that we just do our sister venting support uh, meetings once a month. And at one of them, we we just made the declaration that, you know, there's some founders of organizations in Chicago and then there's the real Chicago founders. And so oh, yeah. that that's a whole different thing. Right. And so yeah. this is the first inaugural conversation we have with another real Ooh. Chicago founder. So, yay! Yes. So a little bit of background about my illustrious guests my shiro history making history making shiro sister friend first and foremost she is a saluki siu uh and graduated in aviation from uh siu and went on to just do some phenomenal things tam you you've like broken records you've um gotten awards you've uh pioneered your space in aerospace and aviation and now the work you do with young people bringing them into uh those careers in aviation is is just incredible so why don't you talk a little bit about that well uh the name of the organization that i founded is called the aerostar avion institute uh, we have been working since 2008 to literally give wings to dreams, is what we say. So our students are from underprivileged background, underserved students who uh, have just not had an opportunity to be exposed to STEM careers, and especially and particularly careers in aviation and aerospace. So I spend my life uh, giving kids opportunities to learn about aviation the different job opportunities that exist within the aviation uh, industry, uh, different pathways in science, technology, engineering, and math by way of aviation. And so it's been a privilege. I uh, just got noticed on Facebook today that one of my former students just got tapped to be a drone pilot for the United States Air Force. What? And is in officer, officer candidate training. Uh, started with me when he was 16 years old uh, over the summer. And we have so many stories like that of young people who have literally uh, changed the game um, in their ability to be a major force and to be recognized uh, in aviation and STEM. So any anybody, any parent listening uh, want to uh, get their kids involved, visit avioninstitute.org, A-V-I-O-N institute.org. And we love to, love to, love to get your student uh into our programs we will be fully online uh this summer so we're looking forward to sharing that information and uh we can we literally uh get kids high so that's what we do through aviation and aerospace education so that is incredible um and i'll we, before we end that information will scroll across so people can follow you um so we know how incredible that is that young people get that opportunity because who did we know you know you you heard of bessie coleman but bessie coleman was an ancestor you didn't see her you know what i mean and outside of her you didn't know anybody uh who was a pilot of any kind you know everything was always in the history book so for you to be living history that is absolutely incredible so Thank you saying that word incredible because that's exactly <laughs> what you are so i'm and not only like let's let's talk also because you're you're giving these opportunities to young people but you yourself we both were young people before so i want you to kind of talk about how you even made like what how did you get to get where you are now what was it that sparked you because i think that beginning is a huge part of today's conversation absolutely 
So uh, my spark uh, started out as an explosion. <laughs> I, I came into this world, you know, with, as a ball of energy. And so um, for, for me, uh, it, was a, it was a rough patch. Uh, my preteen, teenage years, just trying to figure out who I was, um, why I was so much more aggressive and angry than other girls, uh, why I was so much of a tomboy, why, um, you know, I exhibited uh, and expressed emotions and feelings uh, physically. And uh, I just had no concept of, um, of, of, uh, you know, personal emotional responsibility, right? I had no concept of, you know, what uh, what emotional abuse looked like when children do it to other children, which yeah. is bullying, which I was. Uh, and so for me growing up, I grew up in a three bedroom apartment, 13 people. Um, I was the authoritarian from a very young age. Uh, still out, of, out of seven siblings, people still think I'm the oldest. Uh, because I just carried that much force and energy mm -hmm. and dominance uh, as a personality. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, you know, my, my intelligence uh, as a child uh, and as a student was impeccable. Mm -hmm. And not, not by my standards, mm -hmm. but by what academia said an excellent student was. I mean, I made great grades, but that side of the report card that... <laughs> say uh, behavior I never got money for that side and after a while they stopped giving me money for straight A's because they started to say it doesn't matter you know it doesn't matter if you getting straight A's if you can't control your temper your attitude your mouth and stop fighting and so I never correlated the, the two you know I never saw my behavior as a problem mm -hmm. uh, and what I learned to realize is that growing up in a very traumatic environment, low income, violence, a lack of resources. Your personality, especially as a young girl, a young attractive girl, you know, with with an adult body, like way sooner than you should have had it, is like you have to become a survivor. Like yeah. everything is defense mode, mm -hmm. is survival mode. And so my attitude and my ability to put up these walls and these defense mechanisms is what allowed me to survive. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely what kept me from, you know, being uh, a prey of a sexual predator. It absolutely what kept me from, um, you know, allowing myself to be in abusive relationships or traumatic. Like I just wasn't having it. You know, I wore my special shirt today for this particular occasion. This has literally been my motto before it was a scripture. <laughs> And uh, I don't think it's in the Bible, but, you know, it's probably something like it in there. So, it's in the word of Tamara. It's in the holy word of Tamara. <laughs> but I say all that to say um, it has made me tremendously successful in corporate America, dealing with 90, 95% white male industry and aviation to only be the, to be the only black person, to be the only female, to go through all of these different phases and stages of my life, having to fight for a seat at the table and not just for me mm -hmm. but have to fight for my colleagues have to fight for you know other black girls for other black and brown kids for other people who were shy or timid or docile you know i was always i always became the advocate mm -hmm. so i think a lot of what we're going to talk about today is how to reach not just you know the how just not to reach kids in general mm -hmm. but how do you reach the bad kids how do you reach the kids that are deemed you know rebellious and mm -hmm. You know, what tactics do work, what tactics don't work. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I was so happily happy when I sent you the text. I'm like, sis, I was literally just saying, thinking to myself, we should just go live. He was like, I thought the exact same thing. So I want people to be able to take from this conversation that there is no one way no. to reach or impact and communicate to children. You literally have to, what they call it now, code switching. You have to be able to be dynamic. You have to be able to be a good listener. And everybody's not good at that. And every kid doesn't receive the same information or chastising or scolding the same way. Yeah. Now, I know I didn't. I know yeah. I needed tough love. Anybody who came close to me, you know, just trying to be, you know, talk it out. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, that's not happening. Yeah. Let somebody come grab me by my shirt and push me oh. up the wall and be like, I saw what you did. Mm -mm. You do it again, you're done. Oh, oh, okay. 
I, I got you. Uh, see, Don't need to say it again. <laughs> see, putting your hands on me uh, of any age, that would have been a, a bad situation. And so. The- it depends, on, it depends on who it was. Yeah, it depends on who it was. So you, I, the the thing is, we had this this um this uh conversation on uh, Facebook yesterday with uh, difference of opinions and different experiences that we bought in, and other people chimed in too. And I wanted you to talk about your background because I think we both are as passionate. I think we are where we are now because of our background at when growing up and just like you my background also included being a, a great student you know academically and um also being teacher's pet in a lot of sense senses as senses too but uh getting along with others um being able to respect authority right like that was a big big pushback for me was always with authority and it it for me i just have to explain this because i think this goes into also um this this conversation is that um my pushback for authority wasn't any and every authority but it's just knowing that sometimes you grow up in households so i didn't just live with my mother and my father they got a divorce well then i had to move in with my aunts and my granny and so it's a lot of adults a lot of authority and you know back in our day any adult is your authority and any adult can discipline you they can do whatever especially Mm -hmm. if your mom is at work or your mom at night school or whatever she's doing like in my situation then whatever adult is there is your um and oftentimes that adult that I was left in the care of wasn't a very caring adult and was abusive in a lot of ways. Right. And a lot of adults we saw that, you know, they took that authority for advantage of it and, and uh, abused their authority. And so I was one like you who advocated against it, no matter what, if you have a badge, if you have oh, yeah. a mayor, whatever it is, you cannot abuse your authority towards me. And even, you know, um, I talk all the time about being slapped across the face when I was 17 years old and less than a hundred pounds standing in front of the high school, Simeon, um, by a six foot, police officer, almost 300 pounds and slapped me across my face. Um, So those kind of things, I understand, you know, I think we both have that understanding of, of, of what it is to be a young person uh, with a voice feeling powerless, but at the same time having power, but not knowing how to direct that power. And so that's what we're going to talk about. So the conversation uh, came in response to an article that was um, uh, published about young people and their response to what happened on, um, I can't recall what what weekend it was, maybe it was two weekends ago um, when everybody was outside. It was a, a, a beautiful weekend. Uh, sun was shining and, and young people just were, everybody in the city, not just young people, but mm. north side, everywhere you look, people were congregating and out just like what no shelter in place. Yeah. And uh, the it went viral with uh, the mayor approaching uh, some young men on a basketball court. And for me, this is what I saw. These were the optics that I saw. I saw the mayor uh, with her staff and team, um, all of them covered up with masks on approaching the basketball court. And I saw the mayor in a very, you know, tough stance because we know I'm not and I'm not I am not saying angry black woman trope here because I I think you and I both carry that same kind of energy. So yeah. I'm not downing her energy, but but she just came with this. This is what I said. Get off the court. Go home. And t- she turned to leave like do what I said. Right. She was a G. And unfortunately, she was addressing some G's and they were like, and let me not say they because some of the young men were uh, they all turned to leave. But mm-hmm. some of the young men had something to say back and some of them were saying, no, just go. So it was a mixed crowd. Mm-hmm. And so you say to that, uh, the comment he made, bald headed, uh, whatever he called her, it was uh, absolutely, I in no way condone right. that at all, ever. Um, but what what's your take on that? You know, I, I, my thing is based on the reaction of uh, the young men, there are always going to be those kids that are just belligerent, right? Mm-hmm. Just belligerent. 
Like you can't tell me nothing. You can't say nothing to me. For for those people, I heard somebody else posted yesterday from the for the kids that I did with. Sometimes it just there is no talking to them. Mm -hmm. There's no talking to them. It's not tough love. It's not compassion. It's not empathy. There's no talking to them because they got a chip on their shoulder. They got something to prove. Ain't nobody going to disrespect me. And if you really want to get deep into the conversation, this is where the, this is where the, the, the gun and the drug, the gang culture comes in, right? Where, where you just going to kill somebody or shoot somebody for saying something to you that you don't like. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of chip that doesn't allow for healthy communication in any space. Mm -hmm. And so when I think the biggest thing that probably happened when she showed up on the, on the court was that they was embarrassed mm -hmm. that they got caught because they probably went on the court knowing that they, that we, that it was under shelter in place. They had seen all of the memes from the mayor. So I'm, I'm not giving them the benefit of the doubt that they didn't know they were supposed to be out there playing basketball. They wasn't supposed to be out. I'm thinking they knew for sure. You're not supposed to be out here on the bath basketball court playing ball and you just got caught. So, that led to my response of saying, how do you complain about how somebody came at you when you're breaking the rules? Mm -hmm. You're being rebellious and breaking the rules and you want somebody to come to, and talk to you and, and approach you in a specific way to have a conversation about why you did something you knew you ain't had no business doing. Mm -hmm. that, like, that's so far away from how I approach kids. Like how mm -hmm. I, approach, I can't even wrap my head around that. So I, for me, Sis, it's always going back to the intention and the the root of what do you want the outcome to be of this interaction? Right. And for her to show up the way she did uh, on a basketball court with the full authority that she has to do as the mayor and have put in a a, a place, uh, I, there, there's a level of authority that comes with just a parent showing up and telling mm -hmm. you to get off the basketball court. Mm -hmm officer coming up with a gun telling you get out the basketball of course and the mayor of the city coming to show, like the lack of respect to just shut your mouth and get off the court when you hand up when you were in the wrong i think that's where i can't come today defense that's where i can't come today defense and so i i hear your point and we can talk about this as we move through the conversation mm -hmm. when you come down that with actually trying to share knowledge share information to build a culture of communication where, hey, we want to talk about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. How do we share with young people the severity of what's happening, how everything that they do impacts not just them mm -hmm. and not just because, but so, because somebody can die in two weeks because you decided you wanted to go play basketball. Mm -hmm. Is the time, is her walking on the court that day the time to have that conversation? I don't know. Um, I wasn't in her headspace when she was with her team mm -hmm. and they decided to hit the streets to do whatever they was going to do, do, whatever they were going to do. I, I don't know if somebody called her and said, we got boys out on the court right now, come, mm -hmm. come get them. Mm -hmm. like, so I can't speak to where her mind was mm -hmm. when they all were out in their entourage walking through the city. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was a physical manifestation of the memes, right? Mm -hmm. You think you're about to go outside, open the door, oh, there go Lori. <laughs> you're about to go to, you know, ride on the lake, oh, there go Lori. It, it's all fun and games mm -hmm. when she show up on the meme. But when you go out to play ball and she actually show up, <laughs> like, it's a meme come true. <laughs> I literally just came up with that off the top of the dog. I love that. It's a meme come true. It's a meme come true. <laughs> he literally showed up. Oasis, you got to get that. You got to get that on the shirt. Hey, you got to put that on. I'm the all shirt. about my shirt, so I might as well get it. On. It, she, it was a meme come true. They literally joked about it and played about it, played with it so long. Everywhere I go, here come Lori popping up. Now you out playing ball and Lori pop up for real, like. It's not a game. Yeah. It might be funny when it's a meme, but I think the reality set in, and I think I think the ones that got belligerent were just embarrassed. 
And see that, and that's where we defer because what I believe in, what I, um, because my husband and I, we we talk about this as we're driving through. We live in Inglewood, and so as we're driving through, and we're on our way maybe to the grocery store or something that we deem essential, right? Mm-hmm. And we're in our car, you know, in the comforts of our car, returning home to the comforts of our home. Um, you and I both are mothers, so I think we should have said that too. So we're both mothers. I'm a mother of young adults, so I have. A uh, twenty-year-old and a twenty-one-year-old. Yeah, he'll be twenty-two in August. <laughs> so I have two college students home, and the difference is, my I don't have I don't have the debate with them about going outside. They don't have the desire to go outside unless my son is doing some photography or something with his drone. But other than that, it's not go hang out. We don't have those kind of conversations. And I think is we don't have to have those conversations because they have the luxury of having their own bedroom. They have the luxury of having their own computer, multiple devices and phones and Internet access and Netflix accounts and Hulu accounts and every kind of account. They have that. Right. But then I also know that there are some young people who their bedroom is the family living room. Oh, yeah. Been there. Been there. Family is sitting on your couch all day. You can't even sleep. There's no food in your house. Yeah. You have uncles coming and going, and who knows if that's some tension or toxic. You don't know what that situation looks right like, right? Um, and we say, you know, that there's some danger of COVID, and two people can die in two weeks or 14 days or seven days. Well, we don't know if those young men woke up that morning suicidal. And that, and his cousin said, hey, bro, let's go play ball. You ain't got to be in the house. Come on, let's go. We don't know. We don't know if, we don't know if, if, if somebody could have died that day, right? We don't know if he was in an altercation with somebody, had a gun drawn on him the night before, or he drew the gun on somebody the night before. We just don't know. And that is the reality that I think we don't bring to these conversations. We think it's just go home. You got to stay in the house, but we don't, we don't think about all the different dynamics you and i even though we were being problem children we had homes to go to and we had people that would hold us accountable and we had we knew the rules right we knew consequences of the rules and we knew we had respect for some authority figure somebody could check us right but what about the child who's been in foster care who's emancipated from foster care, who's been in and out of juvenile detention or whose parents are in and out of juvenile out of uh, the the system that the 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 system to them only means oppression. It doesn't mean uh, somebody cares about me and they're concerned about my well being. Because my thing is, you know, Frederick Douglass said it best. You know, it's easier to uh, build up strong children than it is to repair broken men. That's right. So this young boy wasn't just uh, twelve or thirteen or eleven year. This is a he was easily twenty, right? 18 to 20. And so where are the authority figures before he gets to this age where, where he's combative with the authority? I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that he, you know, we don't know. We don't know what he's like any other time with any other adult. But my thing is if we're in leadership town, I think, I think we do know what he's like with other people, with any other adult uh, and and, uh, and other people of, of authority, because if the mayor shows up, no, I, I you don't get, know. You get, you get out of with the. I think, but I just the mayor of the city, like of the city of Chicago, the third largest city. She's a global figure. For you and I, we have that. We have that utmost respect for her. Like that's history that's for position. us. But other, there's some people who don't. They don't care. They don't. They I don't care. Less, I got less respect for the police than I got for Lori Lightfoot. Absolutely, you and I both share that in common. <laughs> so, <laughs> You already know that, but, but there, and, and some people may even hold their pastor over her. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's different people that hold different, different uh, people in, in different esteem. And yeah. some people for anything that represents the system, that's an automatic shutoff. Now his grandma, mm-hmm. his, his auntie, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the person that's calling the shots in on the streets, you know, somebody from C, somebody from a, a violence interruption program like Aklavis, um, uh, somebody that ra- a, a man that raised him on the block. 
somebody that put in the work to develop that relationship. Yeah, we don't know the respect and authority. We don't know what he's like in those spaces. And we don't even know if he we don't know what what triggered him by her approaching him like that. We just don't know. And my thing is, all I'm saying is. As a as a leader and as an authority figure, we've got to check our own ego because kids will try you. They will oh. take back. They will be disrespectful. I've I've had you don't even want to know the things that I've had said to me. <laughs> like I've been oh, me too, working at CPS since Ooh, baby. Well, I mean, none of this is new. Yeah. Spread me. I've had kids, I've had the police had to remove kids from the building. Had yeah. one kid stalking me every day, coming past the classroom that he knew I was gonna be in, like literally me mugging me through the window every day. Uh, yeah, one kid that rolled up on me, the whole rest of the, the the boys in the class had to come snatch him before he actually tried to put his hands on me. I'm like, I I didn't been up against some kids, but I tell you, I can tell you now that the number of those kids that have come back to me and apologized. Oh, that's my point. That's my point because they tried it, they tried it but thou then you did. Not. <laughs> thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But thou then you, not. I want a shirt for, for a reason. But here's the thing, too they they came back and apologized because they saw your genuine concern for their well being. They saw that you coming here, you're not here and gone, you're invested in, in us, in this, in our class, in our school. You yeah. are about what you say you're about. But this is my first time meeting you, lady. And the first time I'm meeting you, you coming and being aggressive with me. You yeah, that's how that's how I that's how I am. And see, I, I I I just know that you cannot have any kind of you can't gain any respect without relationship. It just doesn't happen. And, and I and I I have a different opinion on that too mm -hmm. because I cannot have a relationship with somebody, uh, and I can, as a matter of fact, not like somebody and still have a level of respect for them uh, by the position that they hold. I can have a level of respect for their work ethic, but not give a. Uh, care about them as a as a personal friend mm -hmm. or somebody I would want in my circle mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I already beast that what they do absolutely get mad respect for your work we're not hanging out you know mm -hmm. we're not going out for drinks we're not going on girls vacation together girls stripping together so I think that you can have a level of respect without uh, uh with, for somebody without them having earned it and that goes back to the child rearing and how they were brought up and who and who who the authority figures are in their life. If I was th taught to respect authority uh, in a specific way, not 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 being abused by authority, mm -hmm. but I was actually taught to respect because my parents always said, you got a problem with your teachers. Mm -hmm. That's your mouth. Yep. My mama, too. Come talk to me. Mm -hmm. I had enough of your mouth. And if when you get to the point where you feel like you're gonna buck up and talk talk to your teacher mm -hmm. like that, I'm gonna I'm gonna knock you upside your head. That's my mama. School. school. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna talk about what the issue is with your teacher. Mm -hmm. But you're not gonna disrespect your teacher and get loud and, and do all that because now I got to get in your behind. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a level of respect that, and that's why I say all of these kids are different. I would have loved for after you know after the altercation for for the mayor to go back up to him and talk like why would you why would you think that that's the type of response that what i said would elicit knowing or maybe not knowing but trying to understand the entire situation in the city of chicago and and, and, and the number of death deaths that's happening that's my point as well. So so we got to ask ourselves, what is the situation in the city right now? Because for many of us in our homes, the situation is the big bad COVID that is out there. But Tamara, the same, the amount of deaths, homicide deaths in the same zip codes is more are the more same, than COVID. <laughs> are same at, are on par with COVID. So what, so, so for me as a young person and somebody that works with young people, my question is, where's the alarm for his, for his health and his well being outside of COVID? Where are the supports, the way that we've had all the agencies come together and build out these, these, um, these triages and, and all these other spaces? And the so so then if that but but even with another live the that that 
the thing is, that's there every day. So they can't put it off to the side and wait till COVID is over. They're living with this every day. We, I, think that's, I think that's part of the breakdown, though, is because these, because that's that's familiar to them, right? That level of trauma, those murders, losing their friends, uh, being impacted by uh, by death on a regular basis from a from an enemy that's out there that's in the community. That's one thing. That's familiarity. Mm -hmm. I think what comes into play with COVID is the lack of urgency and comp and comprehension that it's just as deadly. If they knew that they get that they that somebody was going to shoot up the park, would they have went out to play basketball? And I think that's their question to us. Why don't you see the urgency of us being killed and murdered? Why don't you? Why isn't the response? Not the question for me, but to the city of Chicago. Yeah, to, yeah. I think to 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 yeah. that's what I'm saying. To 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 the mayor coming in. Where's your response for us? How come nobody's sending in and waving the the flag, uh, the uh, ringing the alarm about this stuff? Excellent. Yeah. When somebody when 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 Laquan McDonald video came out, you know the mayor was the one that hit that video. So. <laughs> So I compl I agree with you a thousand percent. But we got people dying in the streets. The the mayor should be out there mm -hmm. showing up on a basketball court, giving hugs. Mm -hmm. Giving yeah, hugs. And, and she's been in she's been in office, you know, long enough to do that. And 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 these kids are probably thinking you say that's the mayor. I think back to when I was younger and Mayor Washington. I grew up in Bronzeville, and and Mayor Hell Washington was on our block constantly. Yeah walking uh with the driving with the big speaker on the megaphone you wow. he was everywhere so he wasn't this figurehead on the news and in memes he was literally in our churches at wow. our schools uh at the local store you know it was that kind of relationship and i just think that my childhood and your childhood 30 years ago right so this is a whole different dynamic and i think these are the children who've been neglected growing up and they they are now at that point where they we can't control them anymore now they're out and i think we unfortunately there is a huge disconnect mm -hmm. and what i'm saying is that we've got to understand the way we are feeling about the respectability of them just staying in the house and following rules we've got to know the same thing they're thinking as well where is your concern for my life where's your concern for me every day and I want to say that it's not just people like who, you know, I painted this big extreme picture, right, of, you know, somebody's life full of trauma. We don't, the point is, we don't know what his life is like because nobody said, hey, what, don't y'all know about COVID? Why are y'all out here? What's going on? Whose basketball is this? Who bought this bat? Like that kind of conversation can still have authority, can still at the end of the day say, get off this court. But you've built, you've come at them with a conversation versus finger pointing. And I, I also want to say came at them with finger pointing instead of a conversation. Yeah, that's what that's how I think that's what it looked like. That was the optics. I wouldn't have. I, I would. I would really. I would really want to know what their intentions were when they set out when they left the office that day. Like, what was they? What were they? What were they thinking? What were they doing? Um, I just for for me the 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 response was definitely see definitely seemed like it was ego driven maybe even like i said hurt embarrassment out in front of you know their friends and having to having to um you know uh feel like they have to save face because somebody telling them to go home um but i think in order to move forward uh if if Lori was watching this video mm -hmm. you know and i hope she get a chance to see it i hope so too what would what would what would be a way that they can start talking to kids about about and i'm saying kids these was young adults young adults and right they do have a different set of circumstances and it's a whole nother i i don't think we agree on them being you know a neglected generation except in the sense that we neglected them uh or that we that we were so selfish and i'm saying we as in my generation because all of the kids that's in their 20s now were born when we were from all the teenage pregnancies when we was in high school uh so they were raised by babies these kids that, that are or, now were raised by you know parents that had babies at 14, or, 15, or, or not raised by anybody because their parents if if we look at the statistics we know a lot of a lot of their parents are actually deceased 
and they are living with grandparents or in foster care. And we also know a lot of their parents because of war on drugs and things have been incarcerated. So the, 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 the accountability and the hierarchy that we had, you know, if, if you, if your mom and dad didn't check you, your aunties were, or your grand, like it was, everybody had that. We, that's just not what it is. And I think we need to adjust our lens of what it is, what it means for authority. I, I'll give an example, especially if we, if the mayor has a chance to watch this. My son, who was home from Morehouse um, over the holiday break, was driving our car to go pick his sister up from uh, work at the Studio Movie Grill on 87th Street. Mm -hmm. So he's leaving our home, and he calls me frantic and says, "Ma, they're surrounding the car. They, they all, it's like 15 of them. They got their guns out." the police mm -hmm. and it wasn't it wasn't all white white cars it was um you know the, the uh, 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 cars yeah. so my son is now traumatized he has this whole experience and that's not the one and only experience because he's seen it happen with his dad you know oh yeah so so we we've got to know that and this mayor i know this is not it wasn't you know her administration to, has taken on decades old you know, racism and structural injustice and violence. But you've got to come into the community knowing these things have happened and then understanding that you may not be, you know, everybody's not like me and you like black girl magic. Hey, everybody's not that excited. People want to know, okay, what's going to be different? And if you come in the same way, you know, the same rombo kind of way, then it leads itself to think, and I think we do need to talk about what does that mean? I think more of us who uh, are claiming to be mentors and mental organizations, right, need to be having these conversations. And we need to be having conversations with young people and hearing them. And you said you said something that I thought was very um, important. Like you said, you can respect anybody given their position, you know, what they I'm working on that sister. You got me beat by that and you my little sister. So I'm working to be like you in that that regard. Cause but I also but there's a thing too. We have tools, right? And a part of in our toolbox is respect. And so I think that we need to be able to um give them the tools that they need so that they can express how they feel. Give them the tools to understand and be able to process. You talking to you talking to mm -hmm. Can you hear me? I can hear and see you perfectly. You did go black for a minute, but I can see you now. I can't hear you at all. Uh -oh. Audio went out. Can you hear me now? Hold on. I can't hear you. You can hear me? I'm not talking. Can you hear me now? No? Okay, hold Audio on. Audio went out. Hmm, hold on. Let me see something here. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Post has unmuted your mic. What? Can you hear me? No. I can't hear you at all. Audio. Okay, just, just hold tight. Let me see what we can do, how we can do this. Check something. I can hear you perfectly. Is that better? Yeah, I had to. Uh, I had to reset the uh, the audio. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Uh, let's let's look at some of the comments that people are saying because I see. Um, I'm trying to get to them, but I can't. I can't see them. Okay, I'm gonna post some. I'm gonna post some up here. Okay, we actually have um, greetings from Don, Don Sutherland in Ghana. Hey, Don, um, listening all the way in Ghana. Thank you for tuning in, Don. With bridges to Africa connections, were they men? We we uh, uh, I think we're just assuming their age, Sydney Sydney Chapman. Uh, Black girls fly. We are just assuming their age, right, Sam? We don't know for sure their age. Yeah. That they look a lot older than boys. Shamila says, uh, we need to find the root causes for these young people. Yeah. 
I saw one earlier that I wanted to, because uh, I think this goes, here it is. Thank you. Too often those in leadership assume they should automatically reverence and obey because of their position, who they are versus who the other person is. Now, that's a good point, too. Mm -hmm. I want us, though, Tam, because I definitely I don't want this just to be a harp. I want us to provide what oh, yeah. are the tools, like what, how do we move this conversation? How do we work with our young people? Because uh, as Aprecia is saying, uh, and we are both right. Yeah, we, we, we've already agreed that we're both right about this. <laughs> we, sure we are not, we are not debating each other. We both know that there are two, uh, it's 1500 ways, as many children as it is, that's how many ways it is to, um, approach children and Aprecia says, uh, you know, her mom, uh, Di Diane Latiker, everybody knows kids off the block. Um, mm -hmm. both ha ways have worked absolutely, and we and we know that we we absolutely um understand that because young people again, it's based on their own backgrounds and their level of trauma, their P, you know, their level of PTSD is it's yeah. on their triggers. The only thing I'm saying is that as adults, there has to be a protocol and a, a, a certain approach, especially if it's a city approach, right? You and I, and the way we do things, you know, you said it, you know, I'm this type of mentor, you're that kind of mentor. Well, people know when they sign up for girls like me, this is what they're getting. They know if they're getting it from Aerostar, right? But as the city's mayor or leadership in a city, uh, way i think there needs to be protocol it has to be like how do you because guess what i bet you there's engagement policies and rules on how to work with uh immigrant uh populations and that's what i'm saying what was what was the plan when they left the office yeah when what was the plan when they said let's meet up and we about to, we about to walk through the neighborhood and make everybody go in the house like what what was the plan for engagement like mm -hmm. What if they ran up on a whole bunch of people that 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 have guns and say we want our rights like happened in Michigan and they out you know in the street telling people to go home with a megaphone like so I think as a strategy mm -hmm. you know you raise an excellent point what is the protocol mm -hmm. what is the plan and a strategy around sharing information and communication okay yeah the press conferences every day were good mm -hmm. we're watching the numbers go up and up and up that's not gonna fly till through summer no no that's not gonna fly at all okay the parks are closed the the lakefront is closed what is the strategy for allowing people to get outside and to be a part of activities where they can sit have you given given a list of recommended recommended outings or activities that people can do while social distancing no you just told everybody what they couldn't do but then didn't tell everybody what would be some good some good uh some good suggestions or some good activity that they might be able to participate in. Unfortunately, so much of what young adults and teenagers do is communal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, adults have lost a lot of what it means to be in community mm -hmm. because we have <laughs> segmented communities, mm -hmm. right? We got work, mm -hmm. we got home, we got church, we might have our nonprofit or stuff that we do on the mm -hmm. side. But kids' entire life is is social. Mm -hmm. It's usually one social group. That's the school group. That's their friends at school. Are also the friends they talk to when they out of school. The friends that they see wherever they are and whatever they're doing in the video games. But it's the same group of people. Mm -hmm. And so if we haven't figured out a way to communicate to kids how COVID nineteen is affecting how they can be in community. Mm -hmm. And what other ways they can create surrogate yes. communities that yeah. are healthy, yeah. uh, then they're missing a huge, huge swath yes. of mental health, social, emotional well being. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did you tell them they can all go to a football field and do, you know, joint workouts and exercises together? And yeah, stay six feet apart. Mm -hmm. is, is anybody going to go out there with some speakers and a headset and say, Today we doing football drills for all the boys. As long as you six feet apart, mm -hmm. you know we are gonna do football uh, drills on the field. Like I just came up with those two off the top of my head, <laughs> and hadn't had no preconceived idea about yeah. about it. Absolutely, like, it don't take any effort. It does exactly what you said. 
It takes uh, uh, thought, uh, just being aware and cognizant of the fact that there's a need for protocol. Mm -hmm. There's a need for engagement and uh, and uh, uh, rules of engagement mm -hmm. for young people and young adults because the whole press conference and like I said before, the memes were funny until it wasn't a meme no more. Until the meme come true, as you said. Until the meme come true. And here you are on the basketball court and, and Lori Lightfoot show up. It's not funny then. Now you want to get mad. Now you want to cuss her out. But you probably shared the memes, all the memes 50 times and laughed at every last one of them. And so and, and I think also though, when those pro when those uh, rules of engagement and the protocol is made, it can't be made with the people that were in, or flocking her and her entourage. You have got to have young people in the room with you making those rules. And those young people can't just be young people like my children who, you know, college and, and you gotta have every from the streets. Every kind of young person because that's who we're talking to. And so Yes, if you are engaged in one group, that's fine. But this city is huge and there are several neighborhoods. So you may be in Roseland. You may be, there's a huge community, a huge city. And every child should be able to know who you are and should be able to. And again, it's not, they're not going to, everybody's not going to respect you. Everybody's going to say, some people just get off. That's the only thing they get off and being the class clown. And that's even 40 and 50 year olds, right? They say the most outlandish things, the most disrespectful things but at least you can say i followed this this protocol i followed this i gave them that chance to i saw the humanity in them mm -hmm. and they 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 responded back like they didn't have home training and then this is what happens but out the gate you just coming in barging in and the thing is too if if there was a protocol so the protocol should be if you're going into a community to talk to young people that's on the court then you know you're going that way right do you know who's in that community who who is the person that that they talk to that's in that that community it's somebody, it's somebody there so when he said that the person that's in that community that they respect would have checked him right then and there who you think you're talking to right yeah. apologize Mouth, I'm new, 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 new. And he still would have had attitude, but he would have he would have apologized, right? Mm -hmm. And that person would have brokered the conversation between she and that young man. And she would have been able to, to say to him, just like a, another authority figure, a mama or whatever, auntie, whatever they want to call in the memes, she would have been able to check him as well. But it would have also given him some tools as well for himself. Because at the end of the day, I think we what what needs to be um expressed is that we want we don't just want you to not give covid to somebody young people we mm -hmm. care about you as well it's not just about keeping other people safe we the we, the whole thing is we're concerned about your full development not just during covid but even after and i think i think this is the opportunity for the mayor to do those things and her team to do those things. And I think um, I'm trying to put uh, Avion here so we can have the banner run across so people can see um, where they can go on. I think Avion Institute. Three, why you said not that? Uh, uh, Alencia Williams uh, coming on my post saying, I'm glad the world of medicine and governments have come together to target or bring notice to the demographics of morality and morality as it applies to this pandemic. And they now realize how vulnerable they have allowed a part of our American collective to be before this happened. That's one of the things I've been talking about for mm. During the era of the New Deal, Black people were not included in the national relief efforts. We forget. Mm -hmm. we forget. I appreciate that conversation, that the conversation of specified relief efforts would at least look at statistics for every American mm. after the pandemic as well. So thanks for that, A.T.E. Yeah, um, definitely appreciate it. One of the last things I want to add, I know we write at an hour, um, but we appreciate all of the people that have uh, come on and joined uh, for all of the comments. I don't know if we have any more comments, but another thing that I really want adults to learn how to do uh, when approaching young people is shifting the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. If it's anybody that talk about shifting the atmosphere, it's the church folks, right? Yeah, right. Stop praying and shift the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Walk into a school, when you walk onto a basketball court, your presence should shift the atmosphere right. into a positive direction, right. not a negative direction. Right. So if I see anything wrong with what she did, mm -hmm. something in the way that she presented herself 
shifted the atmosphere to uh to cause that gentleman to react the way that he did. And and just the fact that he was belligerent and uh and and shouted expletives and being disrespectful, completely calling her out her name, um was enough for her to know that she touched the nerve, right? Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. But shifting the atmosphere has to be moving the atmosphere from a place of discord and confusion to a place of um, a homogenous uh, mm -hmm. thought, uh, leadership mm -hmm. and uh, solutions and resolutions to mm -hmm. move uh, to move the entire group uh, forward and not just for the benefit or for somebody that can be loud or be heard. Right. And, you know, maybe she took the means too far. Maybe she thought it was funny that they were going all over the place. So she decided to do a pop up mm -hmm. on um, uh, that's that. and see how it would go. Mm -hmm. and that's how it went. So, you know, if they didn't have a plan, when you don't have a plan, you know, that's what I'm saying, punch jump up to get beat down. Mm -hmm. You just walk up on somebody and don't really know what their capabilities are, or mm -hmm. you haven't really thought out the whole scenario and all the different ways that it could play out. That's not a strategy. That's not. Uh, that's not a plan. And it's very unproductive when then you have to deal with the fallout. Mm -hmm. And then regroup and come back and try again. Try again, and that and that's the thing. You're, you, she is the mayor, and this is this conversation is about the mayor, but it's about all of us, right? Because we're all responsible. It takes a village, and so it can't just be pitting the mayor against young people or young that's people. Right. I agree. We have to uh, support the mayor in getting these and getting to our young people to make sure that they understand as well that you know while we are understanding of your you know unique circumstances and we uh we are going to correct you in love yes but you are going to be corrected because you will not be able to first of all just first and foremost take mayor out of it that's a woman a black woman and you don't disrespect black women in our community that's just that's that's the first and first rule no matter who she is um and yeah. so we've got to work to reinstill these kind of values and norms and you made a uh you said something about shifting the atmosphere i'm always so conscious that i and, and hopeful that i do that in a way that uh you raise the vibration right yeah. you know yeah. people are already low vibrating and you help them raise it because sometimes tam and i know you have had this experience i walk into a place and, and they slouching and they sit up you know oh, what yeah. I mean? oh yeah and it could be because we're attractive women it could be any number of things but they definitely straighten themselves up because they don't want to be looked you know they they want to make a good impression and yeah. so raise the vibration so they come up to you don't stoop down to them and so what she may i don't know we can't we don't like you said we weren't in her mind so we don't know but you know sometimes you want to meet people where they are and, and go low or go where they are and you can raise up and, and it, it causes people to raise to you. So That's right. tell people again, we got it um, scrolling at the bottom, but I love you so much. I love you. And and whatever you doing, whatever way you're doing it, it's obviously working because we got young men and young black men and women in the skies. All over the sky. <laughs> paid and, and salaries and introduced to STEM careers. And sometimes they're not in the sky. Sometimes they're working on the planes and um, panic. Oh, stuff. So, yeah, I, I want you to talk more about where they can get to you and, and your organization. So uh, you definitely can go to the website below, uh, avioninstitute.org. If you want to sign up uh, for our newsletter or learn more about our programs and launching of our e-learning platform for all of our summer uh, uh, end of spring and summer courses, scroll down to the bottom. It says sign up uh, for the newsletter and updates. Just put your email address in and you'll get a confirmation email. And um, you can follow us on social media since you're already here. Uh, go on Facebook to AVI Institute, the Aerostar AVI Institute. So A-E-R-O-S-T-A-R, -E Aerostar AVI Institute on Facebook and uh, AVI Institute on Twitter and um and uh what's the other one instagram <laughs> twitter and instagram, <laughs> instagram. I'm, I'm the break freeze. and to follow me uh for inspiration i have my own pages uh tamara inspires on every social media platform that's t-a-m-m-e-r-a -M -M -E inspires on every social media platform you'll find me so thanks so much uh you guys uh we really appreciate 
uh, all of the comments, all of the people that tuned in. I think we had probably over a hundred live viewers. I know. Uh, we did. Mm -hmm. live, and I'm really hoping that you guys just all hit share, share this video. We need people, young people to know how serious COVID-19 is. But I think this was a really good uh, dialogue to discuss the different approaches, tactics, and uh, situations that we can maneuver and create uh, to dialogue with young people about matters that are serious. Uh, gun violence is serious. Um, the, uh, the economic disparity is serious. Uh, their grades are serious. Their ability to be able to perform uh, in school. Um, unemployment is serious for our young people. So it's a lot of serious conversations that yeah. we had. But if we can't get past the initial barrier, which is how do we even talk? Mm -hmm. to kids mm -hmm. it's a non-starter yeah and so if they need tough love send them to me if they need all of the feels and hugs and the whole you know all the lectures and videos send them to Lakeisha <laughs> and you and that's funny because uh uh Teresa who's on here who's uh she just won the National Foundation uh grant uh, and she's at she's on our board. And so she was just saying to me, you know, you are so much more uh, merciful with young people than you are with adults. And I'm, yeah. I, I probably am. But that's because I understand that that I know how I was. And I know for every young person that bucks up, it's a pain and it's a hurt there. And if you address that pain and that hurt, you wipe that off. That is a well, yep. like a diamond and i think that's what we forget a lot of times and so that's probably where it comes from i want to thank you sis uh i, I also want to have me tearing up i thought i was gonna make it through there without, without oh don't you now why are you doing that because i'm supposed to be the tough one right I'm right gonna... and you right. right you trying to make me cry but i want to oh. thank you because something that i always say is that you know i work with girls and I always say, you can't raise black girl magic if you in pain and you have your own thing. So I wanted you, I want people to know also that if they follow you outside of the work you do with young people, you do a lot of coaching. Uh, you do personal coaching. You do spiritual coaching and counseling as well for adults. Yes. Because I'm going to tell you, my personal belief is we can't do anything if our adults are the same trauma and, and pain, they're yeah. trying to raise kids, mentor kids, teach kids, and you haven't addressed your own stuff. So yeah. that's it. Thank you. Thank you, sis. Love you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all for tuning in. You catch us here at Girls Like Me Project tomorrow morning with a COVID responsive programming for the whole family. We'll be here at 10 o'clock a.m. Talk to you all then. Bye-bye.